Good afternoon, everyone. This is Michelle Clark. I manage the vocation, education, employment and reentry unit here at the office of probation and correctional alternatives at the New York state division of criminal justice services. And I just want to thank you all for coming to our lunch and learn today on the distance learning modules. Uh, this this uh, webinar is is something that um, I'm very presented. It's important information specific to help programs uh, adhere to the principles of effective interventions. And with that being said, uh, again, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I hope you're all safe and I'll be turning this over now to my colleagues in the ATI unit and bear unit. I believe I'm turning it over to Shana Kern at this time. Yes, thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you and everyone. Thank you for being with us today. And so, yes, myself, I am, for those of you who don't know me, I work in the ATI unit with uh, OPCA. I've done that since about June 2015, but I've been with OPCA, the former DPCA, since 2003. And um, along with me today, as we, you have heard, Frank Cangiano from the Vocation, Education, Employment, and Reentry Unit, otherwise known as BEAR, because that's so long. Um, is with us here too, and he'll be speaking in the latter half of the presentation. So thank you all. Um, Deputy Commissioner and Director Robert Macmone couldn't be here with us today and he apologizes, um, but he wants you to know also, thank you for being here and everything that you guys do with your participants every day is much appreciated, as well as our ATI unit manager, Nicole Aldi, who is also on the pre presentation here listening with us today. So at the end of the presentation, we will have the question and answer period. If you think of a question, feel free to type it in the chat box and it will be addressed near the end. Uh, but if you have any technical issues, of course, please utilize the chat box as well and one of us will try to assist you. So our learning objectives here today, what I wanna start out with is have have any of you done the DCJS distance learning modules? But basically my question here is, are you familiar with the DCJS distance learning modules? When we say the distance learning modules, do you know what I'm even talking about? I just wanna get a feel if you guys could please type in the chat box for those of you. I know some of you are contractually obligated to do these modules, but of course there's other people that were invited to this as well that aren't. So I just wanna, Frank and I wanted to get a feel who on this meeting today with us today is aware or not aware. So I'm just gonna take a minute to look at the chat box. If you could just type in yes or no, or maybe you're unsure. And that's why you're here today with us to learn a little bit more. All right, it looks like we got quite a bunch of yeses, but also some no's. So this is exciting, we'll be able to maybe a little refresher, but also for those who have not taken it, you'll be able to learn a little bit more and definitely, you know, listen in and watch them if you're interested. Great, thank you all so much. Our specific learning objectives for today, and by the end of the webinar, you should be able to, um, we hope, acquire some knowledges, knowledge for those of you, maybe a refresher, and again, for those of you who have not, um, learn about the distance learning modules that are offered by DCJS. For example, how many there are, we'll talk about what they are about, who developed them, and why we as an agency utilize them for several of our programs um, and our funding streams. Also, learn where to go, because you'll need to know where to go in the integrated justice portal to view any of them. And here, how viewing the modules can be used towards training hours, which is always great to have because some people have to have their training hours in. Also, be reminded of the contractual obligations under some funding streams for program staff to complete the modules within a certain time frame. for those of you that are obligated to do so contractually. And it's also good to learn ways in which the programs can document compliance of each module's completion as we get some of those questions from time to time from the programs, or not sure, so we are gonna go over that. And also, as Frank noted earlier, here from one of our EFS programs, thank you in advance, Director Burroughs from Fortune Society, 
for being with us today and sharing on how you utilize it for your staff, um, the distance learning modules, as well as to be able to share your own experience, how you watch them, the staff watches them, and we'll also open it up too at the end for other programs, because we'd love to hear how you do it, because many of the programs do it um, differently with their staff. They might do it individually or with people, and it's great to hear from the field to see how you are all utilizing them or how you might utilize them for those that do not utilize them currently. In this section following, we're gonna talk about the purpose and overview of the collection of the modules so you can just know what they are um, generally and that because maybe you wanna look at one or maybe the other, some of them might be more applicable to you and your programs. So it's important that we go over just to see a general overview. So here we have the, the purpose and overview here. Just to give you some background, in 2014, DCJS began to implement a comprehensive fidelity, quality assurance, and evaluation system. Now, this was to strengthen the state's investment in community corrections programming. The system included the use of correctional program check checklists, the CPC, which some of you I know on this call are familiar with because your program may have been assessed. This particular tool was developed by the University of Cincinnati Corrections Institute, and this was in collaboration with DCJS and um, a number of our offices, our Office of Justice Program um, OJRP and our office here at OPCA as well. So it was quite the collaboration um, over an, a number of years. Specifically, the CPC assessed program adherence to the principles of effective interventions and encompassed specifically five domains. And those would be leadership and development, for example, talking about staff characteristics is another one, quality assurance, as well as offender assessment and treatment characteristics. So in December of 2015, DCJS announced a new training opportunity. So this was available to all DCJS funded community corrections and reentry program staff. And the training was and is also available to probation practitioners in New York State. So it's basically open to you know everyone who wants to watch them because we felt it would be applicable to to both probation, ATI, reentry staff. And then in December of 2015, there was nine. So we had a total of nine online distance learning modules, and these were rolled out and made available to programs for free. And you know, it's always easier, and especially now too, with some of us still working remotely and be able to watch this on your own time, it's a lot easier with these online modules. So these web-based modules, for example, they cover best practices and risk, needs and responsivity, and they also complement the five domains that were covered by the CPC that I just spoke about as an overview. And also the PowerPoint presentations, they have voiceovers, so for those of you that have not listened to them, it's uh, the UCCI staff, um, and then there's also somebody, you know, they'll be talking about it, so it's um, a little bit different. You're not just sitting there reading. It's like someone, you know, reading to you, so it's a little bit different for some of the modules in terms of other ones that you may have and may do listen to, and they're web-based through the eJustice New York Integrated Justice Portal. So that's where we'll, Frank will go over that a little bit later for how to get to them specifically if you need assistance in doing so. The module topics and timeline here, this is just to give you a visual, because we like visuals, I know I do, in terms of the areas for learning about the CPC specifically, not that you need to know that, um, but that's what they matched up here for the modules, the, the nine of them. So. For example, what works in correctional interventions was the first one back way in 2015. And then goes all the way down to client engagement number nine, which was back in March of 2019, not too long ago. So these were over a number of years that these were all rolled out and available to staff. At that time, they were given individual webinars that we, we did. Many of you may have actually been on those webinars when they did occur going over the different modules and what they were about specifically. 
And of course, like I said, they're still all available now on the portal, but at the time, each one was rolled out by itself. And then we had staff attend that and then went out to the programs at that specific time here for the module release date. So the first one here was what works in correctional interventions? Specifically, this was about the concepts of risk, need, and responsivity, which I know many of the programs, you guys, this is, this is what you do day in and day out, and what we talk about and think about in terms of your participants, and basically the research findings and providing an overview of the importance of cognitive behavioral interventions, which we usually just say CBIs, and effective programming. So this was the first one that we did back in 2015. And then the distance learning module, the second one was really important too, because it talked about staff effectiveness and what this meant and introducing the approaches targeting the delivery of the evidence-based practices, which again, evidence-based practices, uh, EBP, EBP, excuse me, is, you know, what is talked about all the time about by staff in order to strengthen the effectiveness of the interventions delivered that you give to your clients all the time, every day, and thinking about evidence-based practices and what does that really mean and entail and what what are the th things that are important in terms of that and the staff being involved in such. So that was a really good one, I thought. Number three was the assessment and classification. Now this one introduced approaches targeting the delivery of the evidence-based practices by program in order to strengthen the effectiveness and interventions. And really talking about the assessments, results, and dosage. Dosage we talk about a lot in terms of matching the level and intensity of services, you know, to the risk and the risk level of the participant. How many hours are we gonna do for a high risk individual versus a low risk individual, right? Well, I will give you a visual in a minute, but we talk about that in terms of our participants, our probationers, and our ETI clients and reentry about, you know, how much programming and dosage are we gonna give to a particular individual and what is going to be specific, matching the client to what is needed is very important, we know. So this is a visual here that I liked and that we, for those that were uh, action planned um, as I was talking about earlier for the CPC and there was a number of programs if I'm trying to remember correctly 45 that had been assessed by um, the University of Cincinnati Corrections Institute and with that went out and assessed a number of programs so we really like to use this and I thought it was applicable today too in terms of showing the R&R &R. And really that's at the core of our work that the programs do, right? So we have the risk and then driving the level of how you manage risk levels. Are you gonna move low out, right? We're gonna do that, move them out in a way, moderate to high interventions obviously are gonna be different. And there's CBI and social learning facets as well. How are we gonna address the need areas? That's very important specifically to the person. And responsivity here, addressing with intensity and dosage, as I just said, also really important is staff matching, for example, or service matching to the client's learning style. Is there any limitations? Um, maybe develop mental disabilities, their personality type, et cetera. It's just really important, excuse me, that that be done. But I think responsivity is also very important. It's kind of hard to understand sometimes, but it's considering whether the client has been subject to trauma, which is really important too. We think about that, especially now, and how trauma-informed care can result in better outcomes. For example, probation and community correction professionals can work to build resilience in youth and young adults to address trauma sustained by clients and looking into that. So this is just a visual here, like I said, but we I think it's really good to get that and think about that as when you're working with your clients. Number four is case planning. 
So the case planning one identifies strategies um, and it addresses the criminogenic needs and case supervision plans. And that's, you know, it's very important whether it's ATI, probation, reentry, case planning is really at the core of what is done and very important in working with the participant, um, making sure that you're reassessing that, making sure it's matching the dosage level and that you're doing the steps, making action steps within that case plan. So I think that actually might be my favorite one. Distance learning module is um, for this particular one, number five was addressing responsivity. So research has shown that correctional programs that assess risk, need, and responsivity factors are essentially more effective in reducing and addressing recidivism than other programs that don't consider these factors. So the process of understanding this, the responsivity factors can be difficult, but when these factors are addressed, outcomes with justice involved individuals under supervision are more successful. So when thinking of the responsivity principle, one should be responsive to things such as temperament, learning style, motivation, culture, gender, and these are just things that, you know, a different number of facets that need to be looked at when working. I think that the three core factors also when it talks about in this particular module are great in terms of um, the responsivity because it is the least understood and that it really requires the corrections professional to consider those characteristics that are specific to the individual under supervision and those that are generally true for justice involved individuals when they're matched to interventions and treatment service. So responsive, responsivity is, is really important for each participant and understanding responsivity as a worker and working with the individual. For number six here, the uh, CBIs, this module specifically delves into how research has shown that when the, pre the program staff correctly use the CBIs, this is really important that they are effective at reducing the recidivism of the participant. So this is just a uh, visual here talking about, you know, the effective programs and matching it to high quality implementation to positive outcomes. Staff must have a good understanding of the theories that underlie these interventions, as well as the specific strategies that can be used with the CBI modules um, for their services and supervision. Because without these things, we know that interventions may not be deployed correctly and as intended. It's very important that they're provided as intended. For effective programming, we're talking about identifying and adopting what works. How many times have you all heard? What works is that's what we do. What works, what's important. It's just not enough to achieve successful outcomes. We know we have to do more than that. Programs have to be implemented in complex real world settings. You know, we're out there in the real world, we're, you guys are out there in the real world, should I say, doing this day in and day out. And it, be, it, can, it can become very complex, especially now given the pandemic and the times that we are in, right? So the quality of program implementation, it's really crucial to successful outcomes, especially for our programs right now that are doing things in, you know, a different way, should I say, trying to do these CBIs, especially I'm just trying to think of our, our jail programs, but I know another, you know, a number of programs, it's very hard to, to do these things at this time, you know, and even in general time, but it's very important that they try to be implemented as intended because we know poorly implemented programs can actually make offending behaviors worse in the long run. So we're going to look at a visual here that this particular example here. So this is an example of program implementation and program effectiveness. If you see here with the green, the green, hopefully you can see this, the green bars, and this is talking about the competency of the programs. So it shows more competent programs, the more competent programs here have a lower recidivism, recidivism rate in 18 months other than the, those that are not competent or the control group, for example. So if they're implemented as intended, it 
is has a better and lasting effect in terms of their recidivism, which is really important. It's common to underestimate the number of steps involved in implementation and differences among program participants. Even under the best circumstances, implementation is exceedingly difficult. And we realize that. A well-designed but poorly implemented program, as I just said, can fail as easily as a poorly designed program. So I like this um, particular module because it really shows the importance of the program, infect program effectiveness if it's the programs are designed as intended to show the importance of that. Number seven here is the behavioral management system. It really goes into the importance of creating a behavior management system. And it discusses that in length, particularly the elements that comprise it and how to most effectively implement a behavioral management system. Many of you guys may have this in your programs and steps to achieve such. You can have it in possibly your procedural manuals that you may have for your programs and go into it. This just gives an example and um, talks about modifying offending behavior of participants and goes more into that. So you could always utilize that and some of the ideas for your own programs as well. Number eight here is the implementation. And this is really going into, we just talked about the facet of making sure you know it's as intended and it goes a little bit more deeper in terms of program implementation and for this particular definition we're really referring to any changes that could take place in an agency including things such as adaptions to behavior management practices changes to scheduling for example introduction of a new curriculum or even changing how case management is actually structured so it really goes into identifying the key elements to consider as well as details for a four, a four phase process is included in this particular module of how you could be able to employ for effective and successful implementation. So it, it kind of builds off the other modules. I mean, as they all do, but this one specifically as off of the last two modules. And last but not least, which I think is very important. I know that you all would likely agree with me is certainly the client engagement that providing an overview of the importance, how important is you is it for you all to engage with your clients and adhering to the specific responsivity principle that was just discussed from a few modules ago, it will go into focusing, how do you engage and how do you motivate your clients? I love to hear from the programs about you know, the way you all you all do that and work with them and, you know, specific um, uh, examples that I've heard over the years, very motivating. Containing a brief introduction too is also provided about principles of effective intervention. It goes into that with a focus on specific responsivity. Again, it kind of like builds off the other modules of that, to that talks about responsivity. And it also provides general engagement techniques and several structured engagement techniques. So it's kind of like also for beginners to give you that general overview, but it also provides maybe people who have been working in the field for years, maybe they just want to up their game and you know learn more specific techniques to engage with their clients. So this is what this provides in the last module. It really ties everything together. So I really like how they all build off one another and kind of wrap up everything in a bow. It's, it's good. So I hope those of you that um, haven't watched the modules will be able to look at them and watch some of them. I think this, this would be really, really good. And then you could, you know, take that and use that, utilize that when you're working with your clients. And again, like a refresher for some of those programs that maybe not have not, they've watched them, but they haven't watched them in a while. Now I'm going to turn this over to my friend Frank from the very unit, and he's gonna conduct a little poll once I put, um, 
pass him the the ball over here. I really thank you all for being here again, and I'm going to send it over to Frank. Thank you all very much, Sheena. Um, so I was waiting for, uh, I'm actually gonna grab the ball to, present, to become the presenter. All right. And um, as part of the uh, the start of my of my presentation, I'd like to um, send out a poll to everyone. So everyone can bear with me for a second. I'm gonna set up this poll and now I'm going to open it up to the floor. So very simple poll asking, do you currently have access to the IJ portal and distance learning modules? So for those of you who are able to see the poll, please feel free to, to answer those questions. I'll give people about 30 seconds to a minute to, to answer. Looks like we have a lot of yeses coming through. Um, I see some people in the chat indicating that they don't know if they have access to the portal. Um, so we will, we will certainly get um, get to that later on in this presentation. So for those of you who have answered, um, um, thank you very much. I know that people are 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 calling in or signing in from different methods. So not all of you might have access to this poll. So uh, I really appreciate everyone who was able to respond. So I will now close the poll to give people another 20 seconds or so. Thank you very much, Carlene. Um, you couldn't answer, but you, well, you said yes, you have access to it. Thank you. And we're still waiting for the WebEx polling countdown to end. Then we can move on to the presentation. So it looks like I'm just going to show everyone the uh, poll results if you see it. it. Looks like the majority of you who answered said yes, you have access to the IJ portal. But we have some people who says they're unsure. Um, so hopefully, um, with the information that I provide to you right uh, right now, I can. Uh, perhaps provide you an avenue to perhaps uh, request access um, to the IJ portal and the distance learning modules. So in order to access the um, eJustice New York IJ or integrated justice portal, um, you have to use the following um, web address to access it. It's HTTPS um, colon forward slash forward slash www.ejustice.ny.gov forward slash. And that will take you to the login page for the eJustice New York Integrated Justice Portal. In order to access the IJ portal and view the Community Corrections tab, um, users must be assigned what is called an IJ underscore ATI role. Um, if a user has an IJ portal account, this request can be completed by your agency terminal agency coordinator or TAC uh, via the feedback function in the IJ portal, uh, providing your portal username in this request. So that's only for those users who um, already have an IJ portal account. If a user does not have an IJ portal account, um, your agency has to make a request um, on what's called an application B. Uh, from your OPCA program representative um, and complete that for general IJ portal access and the community corrections tab. Um, so for those users who have an IJ portal account, the request can be completed by your TAC. For those who don't have an IJ portal account, you have to submit a request through what's called an application B. If your agency or program um, does not have a copy of a blank application B, you can certainly reach out to your OPCA program representative um, and request that particular application. If you are still unable to gain access, um, even when you are assigned a username and you are given access, please ask your agency's TAC to contact the New York State ITS fix-it email address. 
which is on this PowerPoint slide, to secure the necessary access and permissions. For external users who are not part of New York State ITS or DCJS, uh, please call the help desk um, at the phone number listed or use the feedback option within the eJustice New York portal. And please, if anyone has any questions while I'm presenting this section, um, please feel free to enter it into the chat um, and we will answer or do our best to answer these questions at the end of this lunch and learn. So navigating the community corrections tab in the IJ portal. Um, so you are a user, um, you have access, you've been granted access. So once you have reached the eJustice homepage and have entered your username and password, you may then access the community corrections tab as long as you have that aforementioned IJ ATI role assigned to you. So on a navigation panel, which is a screenshot of it is right here, um, you will go to resources, then reference library, and then finally community corrections. From there, you will be directed to the community corrections homepage. If a drop down for community corrections does not appear when you log on to the IJ portal and you follow these prompts, you should have your agency TAC request the IJ ATI role to be assigned to your user account. This is a screenshot of the training section that will appear as part of the community corrections tab. Through this training page, you will be able to access the distance learning modules that were previously provided as an overview by Shana, as well as other past trainings provided by DCJS if they are posted on this particular tab. The font's a little bit small, but you can see that they're on the particular tab, if you go in, you might see some trainings on um, grant amendments requests. There might be some trainings um, that I have held on already set work reporting, as well as on some of our um, youth focus employment curricula. Um, so there's a wide range of, of all these types of trainings um, on this particular tab, including distance learning modules. Programs can use these modules as training time opportunities, like Shana mentioned before. These can be used as in-service training to staff, count towards staff training hours, and also um, these distance learning modules can allow your programs to have discussions with each other. Um, you can have periods where your staff um, view these modules and then hold a staff meeting to discuss um, some of the topics and concepts that were presented. We certainly suggest using these modules as a training opportunity for, for your new staff. Since each of these modules range from about 45 minutes to 90 minutes, um, I think it's best that you um, take the appropriate time out of your schedule to be able to view them and really process the information that is being presented to you. As Sheena mentioned, um, distance learning, there are distance learning contractual requirements um, for our DCJS funded programs. For those of you who are familiar with the contractual work plans, um, they indicate that program staff have to complete all nine of these modules within six months of the contract being executed or within six months of staff being hired. Um, so it's the expectation and responsibility of programs to um, not only get their staff access to these trainings, but also to uh, maintain a log documenting training completion um, signed and dated by the particular program's program manager. Here's an on-screen example of uh, perhaps a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet you can create. Um, since certificates are not generated, at the completion of any module, it will be up to really the program manager um, to talk with their staff, um, schedule time with their staff, and ask their staff to let them know once they've completed um, all nine of these distance learning modules. This tracker displayed here was created by, by OPCA as a sample, 
And if anyone would like a copy, please feel free to reach out to your program representative and we will certainly send you one. So now I would like to introduce Ebony Burroughs, Senior Director of Employment Services from the Fortune Society Employment Focus Services Program. Although it is not expected from DCJS that programs are able to deliver these distance learning modules um, in creative ways based on people's time, people's schedules, um, Ebony has graciously agreed to provide us a testimonial um, of how her agency conducts the distance learning modules um, with her staff. Um, so Ebony, um, the floor is yours and thank you for being with us today. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much Ring, for allowing me to speak um, and present what we have done with the Fortune Society um, Employment Services Department. Again, my name is Ebony Barrow, Senior Director of Employment Services. Um, I've been with Fortune for eight years, so I've been through many, many of the distance learning modules for many years. Um, and so historically, what we have done, um, how the distance learning modules were presented, were in unit um, group meetings, and we would go over the modules um, through PowerPoint slides, um, X, Y, and Z. So last year, because of the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, everyone had to go 100% remote. And so the, um, the distance learning modules still had to be executed. So in order for me to, we have about over, a little over 30 um, staff members within employment services. And so to keep track of the modules and um, just to create a, a way of ev how everyone can retain this information, I decided to split up um, the staff into two groups. Um, they were able to come up with their own group names and I just made it somewhat of a competitive but fun learning experience, especially since everyone was remote and they um, and just the ways for everyone to kind of interact with each other. We have a couple of sectors within employment services, so everyone was kind of mixed and matched, whether it be a case manager or an employment specialist or a manager or director. So everyone was mixed and matched within these two groups. What, how I conducted the um, learning modules was every two, every two weeks, they would be presented with, say, um, distance learning module one. They had the first week to um, do a study group review the entire module. The second week, I will highlight key points on what they should focus on. And the end of the second week, I will provide them with a quiz. Um, I would grade the quiz and provide them with the answers during the following week and give them the um, answer key on why the question was right or wrong and just highlight specific points. And we did all the, the nine modules um, and they, the winner was presented and they received, you know, an incentive. So that's the way it was conducted within employment services last year. Everyone was able to kind of interact with each other, create study groups, they became competitive and it was kind of, it was a fun experience. And so I plan to do it again this year because it did work out. It was a lot of work for me <laughs> with grading quizzes and things like that, but it was a fun learning experience for the staff. Thank you very much, Ebony. As, as a follow-up question, um, I know you have a lot of staff uh, within your particular program, and, and that's probably one of the main reasons why you're able to, um, to conduct those modules that way. Um, but how did the uh, staff react to um, this particular exercise when you were doing it? Um, they, um, they, were, uh, they appreciated the way it was conducted only because um, they, Everyone was so everything was virtual. So this way they didn't wouldn't have to sit through just the PowerPoints and they especially the staff who, who have been through these modules before. And so it was just a different learning experience for them. Okay, great. Thank you uh, so much, Ebony. Um yeah. for your testimonial as to um how the Fortune Society Employment Focus Services program um conducts um, in a creative way, um, these distance learning modules. Um, so uh, just wanted to um, now kind of open up um, the floor to questions from, from people in the, in the audience. Um, I see that 
we have some questions coming through. Um, so I just want to um, just give me a moment to to look through them. Um, and if any questions from you arise during this time, please please feel free to enter them in the chat. Let's say we have a question that came in. I'm asking uh, when we said these certificates aren't generated automatically. Um, does that mean they aren't automatically generated or that the facilitators are specifically told not to create them? Um, that means they aren't automatically generated. Um, it's up to you um, as a program manager and your decision if you choose to, within your agency, um, create certificates for staff uh, when they complete these modules. But that's entirely your decision to make. Um, just as long as there's some way um, for you as a program manager to track um, your staff completing these modules, and just in case your OPCA program representative um, requests that tracking log. Um, but if you want to offer it as a kind of like added incentive that is a certificate of completion, um, that's entirely up to you to do that. And we also thank Frank. We have another question too. If one member of an agency has a login for the IJ portal on eJustice, but other members of the agency do not, does the agency have to turn in an application B form for each agency member? Or would they have to have a general login, for example, or could they for a CRTF program, for example? Um, un unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, um, for the for the eJustice portal, everyone needs to have their own login, which is really important. Nobody can be logging in on each other's, but so they would have to have it if they were, for example, viewing individually. They shouldn't be using other people's logins, for example. However, one way to get around such a thing, if for your staff you didn't necessarily want that, um, to utilize in a staff meeting, as kind of like Frank was saying, if if you were if you're the one, for example, who had access and you could have like a staff meeting and bring up the modules one or whatever you want to view, uh, you could essentially do that and then everyone could watch them together. Um, so you don't necessarily all have to have access to them. Um, but if you wanted to do it individually and they'd have to log in and have that specific username and log in each other just because for security purposes, each person should have their own login. Thank you very much, Shana. It looks like there's another question that came through um, asking uh, me to go over the process to get the IJ ATI role assigned or to show the slide again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to backtrack to that particular slide um, and just go over the, the process of getting that again. So just bear with me for a second. And while I'm doing this, please feel free to ask any other questions that you might have. So I briefly spoke about accessing the eJustice New York IJ portal. And then I believe um, this is a slide that, um, that the individual was asking about, accessing the eJustice New York IJ portal. To access it, the users must have a username and password. To view the community corrections tab, users must be assigned the IJ underscore ATI role. Um, so if you have an IJ portal account already, you can make this request to your agency tenant um, via the feedback function in the IJ portal, providing your portal username in the request. If you don't have an IJ portal account, that's when you have to um, request and submit the application B from OPCA program representative. I hope that answered your question. Or the question that was posed. Yeah, go ahead. Frank, this is cool. I just want to add, you did, first of all, you did, that was explained very well. Thank you, because it is a can be a complicated process. But I do want to add that if you are a probation department that runs a um, an ATI program, like like in our US or community service program and you have access to the portal, like Frank said, under uh, under your probation ORI, so you're able to get on the probation suite and whatnot, 
as Frank identified, you can just ask your TAC at that um, at your department to add the community corrections role to your account. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicole, for that. Sure. I'm just going to scroll back to the question slide. I want to give people maybe another minute or so to ask any questions in the chat if they have them. As that is happening, I'm just going to scroll back to make sure you didn't miss anything. Yeah, it looks like there aren't any questions coming in or to either everyone or being sent privately. Um, oh, here we go. This one's coming through. Um, question came is coming in. Are there other roles probation officers could be using for programming or is it just a community corrections role we should request? Um, so specifically for the distance learning modules, they're located in the community corrections tab. Um, so that would be the specific request that you would make to gain access to the distance learning modules. And like I said before, there are a wide variety of trainings available on that particular tab, not just solely the uh, distance learning modules themselves. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Yeah, there's compass training, um, like stuff about that. There's director's memorandums, there's research information, um, a whole load of good information that probation could also utilize as well, especially for those programs, as Nicole discussed, that are our 13A programs that are ran by probation departments. It's good information that I, I seem to find that a number of probation individuals don't really know about when I, you know, a question comes across my desk and they say, what's this or where do I get this information? So it's, I'm glad that we're having this webinar and these conversations. So anyone that wants access can certainly have it to gain more information. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Shana. And a question also came through as far as these slides we made available after the webinar. Um, I think generally speaking, um, we will be able to um, at least provide you um, PDF versions, perhaps, of these PowerPoint slides um, to those who are who are in attendance today um, during the lunch and learn. Um, so we should be able to provide those to you, uh, I would say, on a timely basis. So thank you very much for joining us today for our Lunch and Learn uh, webinar series. As you can see on the titles on the uh, PowerPoint slide, here's a contact information for Shana, myself, um, um, Shana's manager, Nicole Aldi, as well as my manager, Michelle Clark. Uh, we hope that you found this information to be valuable and applicable to your work. Please tune in for our next Lunch and Learn webinar in this series, which is scheduled for Wednesday, May 19th, that will discuss professional wellness. If you are interested in receiving any additional training, uh, please feel free to reach out to your OPCA um, representative. Uh, Nicole, or Frank, Nicole has a question, or, or excuse me, Colleen sent a question here about it being recorded. Um, Taylor, if you're still on the line or I don't know, Frank, if you know, obviously these are recorded and it's sent out, but is it posted in the IJ portal, the actual recording? I'm not sure. I can't speak it's to that. Um, the past, it's okay. The past um, lunch and learns are on the BCJS website. At the end of this series, we'll evaluate where each of the recordings go and we'll let everybody know if they're on the IJ portal or if they're on the DCJS website. 
Great. Okay, thank, you. Great. thank you. Thank you. Taylor. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for joining. Please, uh, please be safe, please be healthy um, as you all continue your important work. Um, and we hope that you were um, educated and informed um, during the course of this webinar. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, everybody, today. Thank you so much.